Aloha. Welcome again this week to Condo Insider, Hawaii show about living in an association, men for board members, owners, and anyone else interested in association type issues. And today we're on part five of our four part series on 514B Hawaii's condominium law. Yep, that's what I said, part five of a four part series. That the Real Estate Commission this year determined that the continuing education for realtors would be 514B and they were required to take a four hour course on HRS 514B. And we're trying to take that show in bits and pieces and originally thought to do it in four parts and, and we're on the fifth part which we've called the pre-final chapter of 514B <laughs> because I think by the time we get through with this we'll probably have to go to next week a little bit because there's so much material. But welcome Ben, back my good friend Scott Shirley. Well thank you, I'm like a bad penny, I always show up. Yes, you know how that goes. Turn up and by the way, as you mentioned on the, the Real, Real Estate Commission's course, it was a four hour course, but I think at the rate you are and I are going, we're turning it into a six to eight hour course. Well, it could be. Yeah. <laughs> but we're much more interesting than the regular course, so what can, what can I say? And originally when I sent you the outline for the show, I said, this is the good riddance show for Scott. <laughs> I'm tired of you. It's actually on the script, good yeah, riddance. It is. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but the reality of it is you're doing a great job and your insight's very important. and. Uh, but I really have some doubts about we're going to get through this whole thing today. <laughs> but I just want to briefly review for everybody kind of where we've been. This is about 514B, and we've talked about government structure, you know, like declarations, bylaws. We've talked about government process, voting, and elections. Last week we talked about fiscal matters, financial statements, budgets, and those types of things. And before we go on to our final chapter, even though it may be the not the final day, which is called common management issues. I want to finish up what we didn't, we, we're kind of doing this every week, you know. We have one little piece that we didn't quite get which in Which takes us week. to the halfway point of the show. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's deal with it anyway. We have the budget. The board is going to assess the owners now for based on the common costs. Can an owner withhold those payments because they don't like the budget or they don't agree with the board? Absolutely not. And of course, one of my favorites, especially when it comes to reserves, is why am I paying for retiling to the pool? I never used it. Or why am I paying for the elevator? I live on the ground floor. Okay? And it's because you own a common interest in everything on the property. Yeah. So you own part of the pool whether you use it or not. Exactly. You got, and you got to pay for it. And so my understanding of the statute is that even if they protested it, think there was something unlawful about it or use some excuse it's always about the money the statute clearly says pay now dispute later you don't have exactly your, you don't have the ability to withhold subject to the dispute being resolved yeah. it's pay first resolve your dispute later is that right that, that's exactly right and i think you'll remember i think it was last year's legislature somebody tried to sneak a bill in that said you could withhold your payment until your dispute is resolved. And fortunately, that bill did not go anywhere, but I'm thinking to myself, everybody in the building would dispute at that point. That well, way know, they I, don't have to pay. <laughs> you know, actually this year, that's House Bill 1499. Is it really? And it's still alive. <laughs> oh, no. Truly, it's still alive. But the difference is, and can you just briefly explain what a priority of payment is to, when, you, when you look at people pay their maintenance fees? Well, it, generally speaking, and I think you actually could probably explain it even better than I because you're the condominium financial expert, or so I've been told. Um, Fooled another one. Yeah, including myself uh, all these years. Well, the priority of payment basically boils down to when you send your maintenance fee payment in or your assessment in, it's broken down as to where it goes. And actually, some maintenance fee payments actually, uh, coupons, would actually show that. Like, this is how much is going for going into the reserves every month out of your maintenance fee payment. And I think... Um, this priority payment issue has become a big issue at the legislature over the yeah. last couple of years. Yeah, the primary application of that is that the priority payment means when you pay your maintenance fee, you may think you're paying the maintenance fee, but you're not paying the maintenance fee. Because if, for example, you have legal fees yep. or late fees or fines, your maintenance fee payment first gets applied based on a priority. Mm -hmm. First to legal, second to late fee, third to fines, Thus leaving a balance, if you're disputing this fine, for example, 
of an unpaid maintenance fee, which they can foreclose on. Well, not only that, they can add late fees onto that maintenance fee because it wasn't yeah. a full maintenance fee once they did the priority of payment. And because we're all so smart, what happens is the owner just thumbs his nose and says, I'm not going to pay it. And all of a sudden, he keeps paying his maintenance fees, realizing as they keep sending you legal letters telling you, you better pay this and you don't, that these funds you're paying are going towards yep. the uh, fines and the legal fees. So back to House Bill 1499, just to clarify it. So the new, if this is a, a pass, which I believe it will be passed, what it basically says that the associations have an obligation to tell the owner as they begin a collection mm -hmm. process that they have rights to mediate fines and legal fees related to fines. And they have to do that with a specified period of time. So that, in fact, that if they feel that fine was inappropriate or some legal fees charged them related to a fine or a house rule, whatever it may be, is inappropriate, they get to have a hearing because the association cannot use that priority of payment policy until such times they've had a chance for mediation and attempt to resolve the dispute amicably. And I think this is something that's been in the works for a couple of years to try to resolve that problem because you're hearing more and yeah. more of it. Yeah, and going back to the maintenance fee issue, no matter what, you can't withhold maintenance no. fees you, or common assessments, which would be a special assessment or, or a regular assessment, which is the maintenance fee. We discussed that in our last show. So you've got to be careful as an owner and as a board in the future if this law gets adopted. And, you know, we're, we're already in the conference committee, and, and with it, that bill, believe it or not, on both the House and the Senate side, there are no amendments and no opposition. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, so that, to me, means this will happen, you know, along with the other six bills we're dealing with, well, which may or may not happen. Again, you have me fooled, but I, I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to invite you back if you don't agree with me. <laughs> the hell with you, you know? So anyway, let's just sum this up before we go on to the common management issues and say to everybody, let's be careful. We want to treat our owners with respect. Yes. If they have an issue, maybe they forgot, they had a death in their family, Try to treat people as adults, not in a traffic cop mentality, and have meetings and try to find ways to resolve it. And then if you have a person who doesn't want to follow the rules and has these fines, all this is going to do is require notice to them of the policy, the priority of payment policy, and a right to be heard before you can implement it, which is, which is pretty much due process and fairness to everybody. And I, I, I agree with you 100% on that. I was just talking to an uh, owner in an association the other day who really summed it up in the way I was thinking it too, the way the board was treating her and the resident manager was treating her. And I finally said, you bought a condo. You didn't buy into a prison. Yes. Yeah, because the way they were treating her in this process. So uh, treat them with respect, Well, number one. Hopefully this never happens, but it does. So you have an owner who's now delinquent, mm -hmm. and they're not paying. Remember, whatever the cost of the association is, it's 100 units, it's actually based on percentage of common interest, but they divide it by 100 and everybody yeah. pays one, one one hundredth share. So if 10 people don't pay, you're 10% short of meeting your obligations. Yes, that's right. And so associations have the ability to foreclose, and there's a, what we call a judicial foreclosure and a non-judicial foreclosure. Do you want to try to answer the difference between the two? Well, it's very simple on the non-judicial. It doesn't have any court oversight. It's, uh, real, it's supposed to be quick and easy. Um, just a notice in the paper, notice to the owner, and boom, it pretty much can happen. However, as you and I have noticed over the years, there's been lots and lots of legislation, especially after the mortgage meltdown, um, trying to help homeowners, trying to help associations, and numerous changes were made to uh, the Non-Judicial Foreclosure Act. And the trend I'm actually seeing now in talking to some attorneys is they're, they're leaning more towards the judicial yeah. side. I define it and explain it this way. Associations need that cash flow, that maintenance fee, because mm -hmm. again, if 10% didn't pay, you're short 10%. So non-judicial allows the association to foreclose and get possession of the unit so they can rent it out yep. and get the rental income. And the, any property tax liens or, or the, uh, the bank's um, mortgage are still in place. It's just the association's not paying it anymore, and, the, and, we, and they wait till the bank or the property tax department forecloses on the unit. 
And, and also knowing that judicials usually take quite a sum of time, two, three, four years maybe, yeah. um, the statute was even changed that even if the association was in the process of a non-judicial and a judicial started, they could actually continue with their non-judicial knowing that that judicial one is going to take a while. Yeah, typically, I, mean, I hate to say it, it's three to four years now yeah. on a regular foreclosure, which would extinguish all these other liens like the property tax and, mm -hmm. the, and the mortgage, et cetera. But the associations simply want possession so they can rent it out so they have income to cover these monthly costs until such time as the lender or, uh, in the case of the uh, property taxes, you know, the county uh, forecloses or, yep. you know, uh, takes possession and sells it. And in a lot of cases, that's the only way the associations have been able to stay relatively solvent, especially a few years back when... Yeah, 2008 was a yeah, horrible thing. You betcha. And I would just remind everybody that under the statute, if you're delinquent, don't stick your head in the sand. Deal mm -hmm. with the board because the statute gives you an automatic right to a 12-month payment plan to cure the delinquency. And in addition to that, you still have to stay current with yes. so you're not getting further in debt. So let's move on because... You know, we're pretty much almost through the first half of our show, <laughs> and we haven't even gotten into the final chapter yet. Uh, you know, I, get, I need to teach you how to summarize this quicker and faster and, or have them change the laws so they're shorter or whatever. Oh, so be. it's my fault. Now. It's all your fault. <laughs> you know. Anyway. So, last question on that, though. If a new buyer comes in through, foreclo through um, a foreclosure, let's say, are they obligated for the other owner's fees? That's actually a tricky question. You threw that at me on purpose, didn't you? I did. Yeah. And I'll... Time's up. What's the answer? I've actually seen where they have been able to put it against the new owner. The problem with that, though, is, is why would you want to buy in, in, a, in a complex where they're going to do that to you? Yeah, it really is. Realistically, they're not. But... The statute provides, for example, the lender has an obligation for six months of yep. the past six months maintenance fees. And that's really important people understand that because when you assess people like 20000 in cash or, or versus $400 a month, you create certain liabilities for yourself. If you assess 20000 in cash, it gets foreclosed on, and a new owner comes into an auction and buys it, uh, a judicial auction, by the way, not mm -hmm. a non-judicial, yes. that everything old is extinguished, so they may not get the yep. money where, in fact, if it was $400 a month, they may lose some of the monthly payments, but they wouldn't lose the future monthly mm -hmm. payments. Yeah, so it, again, for a buyer, it behooves them to find out as much as they can about the situation before they try to buy into something like this. Well, I have to tell you that we're now at our time for our first break. <laughs> we haven't even gotten into the subject matter for today, but we have had a healthy discussion to bring to a resolution the fiscal and budget side of it. <laughs> And I would just remind everybody out there, if you have a problem with your maintenance fees or the issues, go to your board, talk to them, try to find your own resolution, because the association certainly needs to protect itself by having adequate cash flow, and so sometimes they have to foreclose to protect their interests. You so betcha. on that note, we're going to take a short break at Condo Insider, and we resume the pre-final chapter 514B. <laughs> Okay, so I'm Crystal. If you haven't tuned into Quok Talk before, you better do it because you're missing out on all the information. We talk about sex, we talk about religion, we talk about everything and nothing. So we've got two gentlemen here going to validate that, right? Greg Kinkley and Roy Chu. What's your take on the importance of talking about these issues? It's very important. It's through, I think, expressing ideas and exchanging ideas that we come to a better understanding of the world and each other. And without that, we live in ignorance and fear. And yep. Fear is based on ignorance. Amen. Mm -hmm. Great. Amen. I, what more <laughs> could I say than that? That's Something in Yiddish. I think. Cheers, on Yiddish. Oi, vey. Come, listen to Quack Talk on Tuesday mornings. Hello, this is Martin Despang. Please join me on my new show, Humane Architecture, like the one in the back that you see by architect David Rockwood. The show is going to be on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii in downtown Honolulu. See you then. Well, welcome back to Condo Insider. We're again in the discussions of Condominium Statute 514B. And at the break, just before the break, we finished last week's show. Yeah, we finally <laughs> finished last week's show. <laughs> and so now we're going to go on to common management issues. And 
if I counted them correctly, there's six, seven, and including get good riddance of Scott, that's eight. But let's deal with the, the first seven and um, uh, talk about some of the common things that come up with regard to 514B, the common areas, the common management issues. And the first is an owner wants to make an addition or modification to his unit. What's the, what's, what's the rules, what's the risk, what's the policy? Well, it depends on exactly what they want to do. If they're just going to be painting an interior wall purple, that doesn't really require anything. But if they're going to start knocking walls down, um, messing with electricity, um, we had a building one time where the owner decided they were going to change some electrical stuff and shorted out one whole section of the building because they did it themselves, no electrician. Um, so uh, some condos actually have rules in place so that you're not using a jackhammer on a Sunday afternoon on the top floor and things like that. Plus, the issue comes into play, are you affecting a common area or a limited common area in your modification? Yeah, I think the basic, what the statute says, what the act says, that if you want to make a modification, particularly to the exterior, mm -hmm. so you want to add a fence to your private yard area of your townhouse, for example, that, in fact, you have to have 67% yes. of the owner's approval on this exterior modification uh, before it can be accomplished. The general recommendation is always submit in writing to the board what you want to do. Because even within the unit, if you're taking out a structural wall or changing the plumbing or electrical, beside a requirement to use a licensed contractor, you would again need to have approval to do that because it could have effects on the other units and the structural integrity or safety issues along that line. So you as an owner cannot just go do it. You well, know. another key issue there is make sure you know what the rules are because some associations will not allow you to take the carpet out and replace it with tile or hardwood, especially older buildings on the upper floors, without board approval. Right. And they're going to require some special sound underlayment yep. to keep the no noise from transmitting. Because I've seen that a dozen times where an owner just changed the carpet, the wood floor, mm -hmm. didn't put any underlayment underneath it. So their neighbor below them is complaining because they can That's hear right. footsteps all the time. You know, so my thoughts have always been a lot of times you'll find the rules within the house rules or some uh, design guidelines for the property. If you're going to make a major change, which would be new flooring, change a wall, plumbing, electrical, provide notice to the board. You betcha. And then you can get a clear understanding of what you can do and you can't do, because there was a case recently on Maui where a person enclosed their atrium without permission. The legal fees, this went on for like four years, this fight. The legal fees for the owner was around $400,000. The legal fees for the association was like $250,000, plus the atrium was there. At the end, a judge ruled that the owner had to pay back six hundred dollars pay his own legal fees, plus mm. the $250,000 for the association, plus remove the atrium. Because he, they never got approval on the way their documents were written. It was a very expensive lesson, probably. A very expensive lesson. So Probably more than the unit was worth at that point in time. Well, this is an oceanfront <laughs> unit in the high-end Maui, so... I uh, just say his equity has been greatly reduced <laughs> by, the, by the end of this. He doesn't have an atrium anymore. So be careful. If you're going to make a modification or to the project or, or even outside, inside, think it through. I mean, if it's just replacing your garbage disposal, it's already there. You don't need the board yeah. approval for that. But if you're going to change anything, change the location of the pipes, change the electrical, you need to get approval. And some of those approvals may require the owners, particularly exterior, of 67% of the owners. I've actually seen pictures where somebody wanted to completely rearrange their bathroom and they wanted the toilet over on the other side. The contractor that they hired was in that bathroom jackhammering to rearrange stuff and the floor of that bathroom literally fell into the next unit. Right. So. And that's <laughs> going to the concrete slab, which yep. is a common element, and you can't do that. And, and you've got to think it through. So go, go to the board. Put it in writing. Be careful. Insurance. Does the association have to have insurance? Of course. It's mandated by statute that the... And uh, what is the insurance? What are the insurance types? Well, we have liability, the fidelity bond, um, directors and officers insurance for the board members. And generally, that, all that insurance that is required under statute is covering not just the board, but the 
exterior of the building, the common elements, yeah. and maybe some to extent the limited common elements. Yeah, that's the building policy. Yeah. So you have building insurance, you have liability, someone gets hurt on the property, a fidelity bond, which protects you against theft yeah. by uh, the board or an uh, employee, and then you're going to have a direct and officer liability if someone challenges the board's decision and sues the board or the association directly. And those are mandated by law. But one of the things that we discussed this on another show, one of the things people don't realize is that within that building insurance, the statute requires them to insure for water leaks, for lack yes. of a better word. So if that ice maker breaks, the owner's uh, washer breaks, or they didn't repair their toilet seal, and that causes a leak, that is covered under the master policy of the association. And the owner, because he pays maintenance fees, is entitled to all of the benefits of that policy. And so therefore, um, you know, uh, uh, you have to submit it to the insurance agent for the association. You may also submit it to your own insurance carrier, yes. but you cannot not submit it to the association, this, this water claim. Well, I think the other thing that people need to be aware of, it, and owners are becoming more savvy on this, on insurance issues than they were, say, five, six, seven years ago, is that the master policy says it will replace and repair as built. And if the building was built in 1977, then that's Formica, linoleum, and things like that. What about your own homeowner's policy? Is that going to cover the difference? Like you put in redwood or cherry wood cabinets and fancy all yeah, sorts of stuff. And, and, and we actually believe we not have a caller calling in with a question, but I want to answer one thing before I take oh, okay. the question. And that is that uh, because insurance is very expensive, you can imagine an insurance carrier who provides insurance and all these water claim protections for 100 unit projects. So they have 100 potential, potential liabilities mm -hmm. and risks. So what associations are doing now is saying, we're going to buy high deductibles, five or $10,000, under the master policy, and require owners to buy an HO6 policy. And the HO6 policy may have a $250 deductible. So on a $10,000 deductible the, of the association, the other $9,750 is covered by the HO6 policy of the homeowner. Of the homeowner. And the reason they're doing that, it's often misunderstood, that it probably saves that homeowner they're paying two fifty for this policy year. It probably saves them five hundred to a thousand a year. You betcha. Because of the fact they've spread the risk to a whole bunch of independent small insurance mm -hmm. companies all over for the homeowner policy, and that's why it's done. But let's go to the question, and it says, "I am a homeowner currently having a dispute with my board, and they're lawyers, and we are currently requesting mediation." My question is: During our mediation, is it within our rights to request reimbursement for my lawyer fees? Or is that more under arbitration than mediation? And I, I can answer that question. I think you should. <laughs> I, uh, the, the statute provides each party pays its own legal fees. Yes. So within the mediation, uh, each person, if they, they don't have to bring a lawyer. They can do it themselves mm -hmm. without a lawyer. But typically the problem is the board hires a lawyer, and yes. so they hire a lawyer, depending how complex the problem is. But the, the legal fees, if you decide to bring a lawyer, the statute provides each person is on their own. Yes. So they have to pay those fees themselves. And so thank you for calling in with the question. It was a great question, and hopefully we've uh, answered that for you. Going back to our issue for uh, the common management issues, because as we predicted, you know, I didn't know you could had predict these things. We're not going to have enough time to call these <laughs> questions. We'll finish this show next week. <laughs> I think we will finish it next week, and then we'll get into some other interesting topics because of all sorts of interesting changes in the industry. But anyway, the next question is aging in place. So you now have a homeowner who's a senior, and you have concerns about their ability to live in the property, mm -hmm. and whether it's safe for them or they're causing a hazard for the other residents. What can the board do? Well, the board can, um, well, before I get to that answer, I'd like to point out, you know, I, one of the areas I specialize, specialize in is fair housing. And they have these two categories for senior living. And the first category is 55 and older. I want to know who the hell determined that 55 was senior. Okay. Isn't 55 the new 40 or something to that effect? Could be. Could be, but... Um, this, this issue of um, doing an assessment of the owner um, 
is so that the board can understand or determine, can this owner live on their own anymore? And in some cases, we had one in one complex where she almost burnt her unit down three times by forgetting the stuff she had on the stove. So we had to do a, an assessment on her ability to live alone. Well, I guess that's the key issue. The Act provides that the board has the authority to request an assessment of that person's ability yep. to live there and what accommodations they may need to make it safer or better for them mm -hmm. to live there. And they can require that. Now, they don't have a legal obligation to do it no. if they have the issue, but they can if they have a senior issue. And I would just briefly tell you that because I've managed uh, senior living these over 55 associations, and, and, and frankly, most people over 55 don't want to live there. It's the ones who are over 80 who want to live there, <laughs> you know, because all the rules and requirements, and that's probably another whole show, too. Well, but, all I uh, care about is my discount I'm going to get. But, but yeah. <laughs> in, in those cases, we've had people who've had mattresses with urine and smells mm -hmm. and stench and hoarding that, in the end, the association had to file a lawsuit yes. to actually um, get the attention of the, of the relatives of the children because of the fact that people wanted to stick their head in the sand and not do anything about the problem. So in the end, you can get the assessment, and maybe it's something the board can do and accommodate, but in the end, um, if they really want to, um, if they feel they legally must make a change to protect everybody else in the property, they're probably going to have to file a lawsuit to do it. And, and it's sad. I think both you and I have been through that process before with these type of situations. And it's usually when you file the lawsuit that services and family finally start to um, yeah. come forward to try to help. And it's interesting because Adult Protective Services told me at one time that uh, following the lawsuit to take away their home, gives them the legal authority to get involved. Otherwise, yeah. if they're eating out of the trash can or whatever it may be, they're going to say they're getting nutrition. They have no involvement. As crazy as that sounds. As, yeah, crazy as that sounds. And you probably know that my next words to you are, we're out of time. We're out of time. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> again, I want to thank you for being here. It's always a great deal of fun to uh, talk with you about these things. And we joke and tease a little bit on the show, but uh, these are serious topics, and we're not meant to offend anybody by some of our jokes. It's all his fault anyway. <laughs> With that being said, we look forward to seeing you all on Condo Insider, or hearing from you all next week on Condo Insider, every Thursday, 3 to 3.30 on Think Tech Hawaii. And we thank the caller for calling in, and we hope if anyone else has questions, they will next week. Aloha and the best to you all.